you will be prosecuted. You should rot in prison for the rest of your lives. Those of you who have done this, people have, uh, have been subjected to violence today. At least one person has died. You must stop now. That was Utah Senator Mike Lee in a phone interview with ABC4 News yesterday with his message to the Trump supporting extremists who stormed the U.S. Capitol building. The security breach resulted in four deaths, one person who was shot and three who had medical emergencies. Welcome to our in focus discussion tonight on the U.S. Capitol security breach. We wanted to know how these extremist groups were able to storm a federal building in just a matter of hours. What shortfalls did our national security team have and what this could mean for federal security plans in the future? Here's our interview from earlier today with University of Utah law professor Amos Giora, who is an expert in counterterrorism. Professor Giora, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It only took a matter of hours for the Trump supporting extremists to break into the U.S. Capitol yesterday. This is something that would take foreign countries possibly years to plan for. How did this breach happen? What were some of the shortfalls? Where did the security team go wrong? And were there red flags they might have missed? I think, first of all, your, your, the word you're using is correct. It was a breach. It's a profound breach. It's an overwhelming failure because I, the president for the last week or two has, has circled or had circled January 6th as the red letter date, you know, the call to duty. And um, we've even seen the clips of, of, of Utah um, participants uh, on their way to D.C., you know, harassing Senator Romney at the airport. There was no surprise here. The fact that the Capitol Police were as unprepared as they were, as someone who um, you know, spent 20 years in operational counterterrorism, it is so stunning is the polite word. Many political leaders and members of the public express how alarmed they were about the security breach. How concerned do you think we should be that this happened? Very because there's clearly a, a group, not small, I think, who's um, locked in and acting in the president's words. And I don't think from their perspective, I think from, for them, having watched the interviews with, they view yesterday as a great success and success breeds success. And if they were su successful in um, capturing, taking over uh, the US Capitol, uh, you know, from their perspective, that's a win and win begets a win. I think that to your question, we absolutely need to be, uh, we need to recognize the, the, the threat that these people pose moving forward. Are there potential consequences or vulnerability that will result from Wednesday's events? Did this reveal a flaw in our system that foreign terrorists or attackers could be looking at now? Well, I think foreign terrorists, uh, wherever they may be, um, are sufficiently schooled and knowledgeable themselves and they don't need to learn from QAnon or the Proud Boys. I do think, though, that we as an, as an American society need to understand that, again, these, these white supremacist groups writ large pose a significant threat to America, perhaps more than we've always seen in the last 15 years. We've looked at foreign terrorism or foreign terrorists. I think we need to have an understanding that domestic terrorism, as we saw yesterday, also poses a significant threat to America. What could this possibly mean for the U.S. Capitol security plans in the future? Is this a big wake-up call for us? Huge wake-up call. Um, I saw before while waiting for you that there are calls to have various people fired and replaced and all that. So that's easy. The more important question is whether or not, again, FBI or local police or, or federal police or local, federal law enforcement understand that these groups are here to stay. Um, does that mean that we need to rearticulate how we define threat to America? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Was yesterday an overwhelming and un inexplicable failure? Absolutely. Um, should people be fired? Sure. But it goes much deeper than that. And that's why I think that from the FBI perspective um, and working with local law enforcement, I think there needs to be, to your question, a, a clear understanding that these groups, A, are here to stay, and B, are locked in on their point of view, and they are, they are violent. And um, they don't leave much to the imagination. They said they did actually what they said they were going to do. Um, 
and one of the things that I, you know, in the 20 years I spent in operational counterterrorism, that I learned that terrorists mean what they say and they say what they mean. They don't leave, there's, no, there's not a guessing game here. Professor, we have time for one more question. Any final thoughts you'd like to share? It is extraordinary. Yesterday was a watershed date in American history. To see the Confederate flag flying in the US Capitol in 2021, I saw, I don't remember what news network, one of the Capitol Hill policemen taking a selfie with one of the demonstrators. You know, it's hard to leave me speechless, but that leaves me speechless. So I don't know if you know, but I've written two books that are tangentially related to our conversation. One is called The Crime of Complicity, the Bystander, and the Holocaust. And the other is called the Armies of Enablers, which is survivor stories about sexual assaults. But the, the theme that runs through both books is the question of complicity. And those who are resigning now, today, or even Lindsey Graham today, yesterday or today in the Senate, they are as complicit as complicit can be complicit. Shame on them. Professor Giora, thank you so much for joining us tonight to share your experience in counterterrorism and perspective on what happened at the U.S. Capitol yesterday. We appreciate your time. You rock. Thank, thank you. you, Professor. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Not only do we see the failure to protect one of the three branches of our government, we also saw a clear failure to carry out equal justice. No one can tell me that if had been a group of Black Lives Matter protesting yesterday, there wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been treated very, very differently. That was President-elect Joe Biden speaking in a public press conference today after Trump supporting extremists stormed the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday. The security breach prompted lawmakers to duck for cover, journalists to evacuate, and cities to enact a curfew. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on the U.S. Capitol security breach. We're approaching the conversation now with the lens in regards to race and communities of color. Joining us live via Zoom now is Dr. LaShawn Williams, social work assistant professor at Utah Valley University. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. It's good to see you. Thanks, Rosie. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Dr. Williams, several people expressed yesterday that if those rioters who broke into the U.S. Capitol were people of color, they feel that those rioters wouldn't have gotten very far and possibly would have been killed. How do you feel about this line of thought? I think that it's completely in line with what we saw happen during the uprisings and protests in 2020. If you think about it, in the 2015, when Bree Newsom scaled the flag in South Carolina Capitol and removed the Confederate flag, the officers were waiting to arrest her when she descended the flagpole. If you think about 2019, when Reverend William Barber uh, protested for the needs of cultures in, in poverty and uh, health care deficiencies. He was arrested for protesting and for praying inside of the Capitol. What's interesting is that when protests are planned, the police are prepared because they, in, they feel that there is going to be a threat and they see the protest as a threat. This protest was planned. Why weren't the police prepared? They show up in militarized gear whenever Black Lives Matter protests are happening. They've shown up in militarized gear when protests around immigration is happening. Why did they not show up? Why were they not prepared? It's because they did not see a threat. What does this say about the systemic racism then that many argue still exists in our country? Well, it says that it's true. It says that this is really a stitch in the fabric of our nation. This isn't anything new. This isn't anything that happened overnight. This has been brewing and fomenting for years. What we saw is a continued demonstration of the systems that are at play where race, color, culture, and difference are concerned. How power is structured to support what it sees as itself and how it is structured to contain what it does not see as itself. Now, you also have some background expertise and training in mental health. What kind of mental or emotional impact does these events have on our communities of color to see how things unfolded yesterday? Well, what you're looking at is the epitome of gaslighting. You're looking at 
people who are seeing differential treatment. You're going to see communities of color watching this display, this complicity, as the professor said before me. And you're going to see that we experience dissonance, which then makes us question our own reality. There's a term we use when we're talking about abuse, and it's called DARVO, which is to deny your abuse, to attack the person you're abusing, to reverse victim and offender, to make yourselves the victim and the person that you abuse the offender. And this is this classic DARVO in play because we're seeing and we're being asked, we've been being asked since the election results to be compassionate and to be considerate for the 70 million neighbors we have whose votes did not win this election. And so communities of color, while we are seeing victory in places like Georgia, who continue to show up and who continue to shift the structure that we have been living under, we see that it is overridden by these displays of violence, these displays of entitlement, and these displays of possession in our nation's capital. And it is very disorienting to communities of color who are simply asking for a right to be heard. So Dr. Williams, what can we learn about the events that transpired yesterday? What does this have to say about the progress that we still have to make as a nation? You know, this is a complicated answer. Um, I think that if we believe that yesterday was the invitation, we're not necessarily paying attention to the call that has been coming since the election 12 years ago, almost 13 of Barack Hussein Obama. We've seen this, this has been our undercurrent. As I said earlier, this is a stitch in the fabric. This is not a new page in the book. This is the same chapter that we've been living in. Every participant who traveled yesterday to DC to participate in this riot returned home today. Every rental car was returned, every hotel room was checked out of, and these people returned home to families, to family members who either actively support them who turn a blind eye or who are desperately trying to help them understand that their way of being is getting in the way of the potential of this country. Their way of being is getting in the way of the dream that so many attribute to our founders, that we can be a, a nation of liberty, that we can be a nation of justice, not for the aggrieved and the entitled only, but for all. Well said, and I think the message that we just kind of have to keep repeating is complicity is not okay. Uh, folks, you've been hearing from Dr. LaShawn Williams, social work assistant professor at Utah Valley University. Dr. Williams, thank you for carving out time for us tonight on the show. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Rosie. What happened here today was an insurrection incited by the President of the United States. That was Utah Senator Mitt Romney speaking on Capitol Hill Wednesday after Trump supporting extremists broke into the U.S. Capitol following a violent riot outside, all while Congress was meeting to certify the Electoral College votes for President-elect Biden. Welcome to our third and final In Focus discussion tonight on the U.S. Capitol security breach. Joining us now live in studio is Chris Burbank, the former chief of the Salt Lake City Police Department and current vice president of the Center for Policing Equity. Chris, thank you so much for being here tonight and joining our conversation. Rosie, thanks for having me. Chris, let's start with what you were thinking when you saw the breach of the Capitol yesterday. What was going through your mind? Oh, wow, I, I think so many different things were running through my mind. The safety and well-being of the people in the building, but the fact that how could this happen? As one who has been to the Capitol many different times and participated in the security process in order to get in and out, and the notion that a group of people could just walk through the doors is what it seemed like to me. It was a tragedy. I mean, this is something that should never happen in our nation. Right. Um, I don't know, you know, how we could really understand this standpoint, but we're trying to pick your brain on it. So from a policing standpoint, can you help us understand maybe the decision-making process that the Capitol Police made? They just seemed to fall back at some point. Could that just have been easily a point of them showing force? And is there a playbook for this kind of situation? Oh, there absolutely is a playbook, and especially one for the Capitol. And the thing that we don't recognize that we give a pass to far too often is the fact this is a leadership decision. Right? I cannot explain the actions that took place. You see video 
of security people, of Capitol Police allowing people through gates, waving them through the door, there is no explanation for this. And the fact that there was no prior preparation. This was known to everybody in the nation. The president tweeted about this numerous times. And even prior to, you know, the hours before, there was no question where this mob was headed and why there was no preparation, why there was no perimeter set up that prohibited them from even coming close to the steps of the Capitol. So with your professional expertise, you would say that there were some shortfalls or red flags that were missed or lack of preparation, all of that. Well, this represents a failure in leadership, starting with the president of the United States and moving right down the row. Far too often when we look at police situations, we like to blame the police officers, right? The racism that exists in society today, in policing today, we point at the police officers as being the ones that are engaged in that. And what we do at the center is we actually study the behavior of police officers. And more important than the individual racism of police personnel, of the officers themselves, is the policy practice and procedure that allows that to flourish under the command. And I believe that's exactly what we saw take place yesterday. Talk about your organization, the one that you're vice president at now, the Center for Policing Equity. Are these the type of issues that your organization discuss, analyzes, um, and wrestle with? Oh, absolutely, and more importantly, try to solve. What we look at is the intersection of race and policing and try to determine what is the cause of the disparity in the outcome of policing. How do we change the bias? And the failure to do so time and time again leads to situations as we saw yesterday. And the tragedies that we've seen play out throughout the nation, not the last year, the last 20 years of my career, the last 30 years in our country. Now, half the battle, right, is figuring out the how, the why, but how hard is it to implement those changes once you've identified what needs to be done? Well, I, I think we have two huge obstacles that stand in the way of police reform or change, all right, or modification of the outcome if we want to soften it. But we need to reform policing and we get right down to it. And one is the fact that we fail to recognize or empathize with the lived experience of people in this country. The experience of viewing a noose at the Capitol of viewing a group of people displaying a Confederate flag. And then we fail to look scientifically, or even from a business perspective, at what we do in policing. The efficacy of the effort is the act of arresting, of writing tickets, of engaging with people. Is that reducing crime and disorder in our nation, or is it increasing or having no effect. Now, Chris, I think you've given our viewers a lot to think about tonight. I'd like to give you the final word in this discussion. Anything you'd like to mention that maybe we haven't discussed yet? I, I think the most important thing is that we need to change and it needs significant, significant participation by police and community. Done is the time of isolated individuals deciding what is right for our community. It is time for communities across this nation to decide how we want to be policed. Well said. You've been hearing from Chris Burbank, Vice President for the Center for Policing Equity. Chris, thank you so much for taking time to join us at the studio tonight. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me.